Hey all, this is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series, and in this one I'm going over my round 3 game from the Charlotte Spring GM IM Invitational. Now, if you followed the round 2 game, you know that I lost a tough one against Grandmaster David Burchess, and it was really not my best effort. I kind of got tricked in the opening and very quickly went into a position I didn't know well and kind of got outplayed. I had the white piece in this one, was hoping to rebound, and um, yeah, my opponent was international master Alex Ostrovsky, who if you've watched a few videos on this channel, you should be familiar with because I've played him before. He's an, I am from New York, and we kind of came up together playing chess at the Marshall Chess Club, so we're very well uh, familiarized with each other's game, and um, yeah, it was always interesting fights. So, any case, uh, let's get into it. I played d4. Astrofi played knight f6. I went c4, again, in the, a different vein than I had done in white games in previous tournaments where I was doing this d4, knight f3, e3 stuff. I kind of moved on to that into c4 territory because um, I was trying to just play fresher positions. e6, knight f3, d5, and knight c3, and bishop b4. Now, bishop b4 actually introduces the queen's gambit Ragozin variation, and this is actually a line that Ostrovsky had been playing quite a bit, I'd noticed, over the course of the year. It's kind of his main weapon against d4 was to play the Ragozin, and it's actually a very, very tough nut to crack. The point is that this pin on c3 is very, very annoying, and additionally, black gets really active play in the center. Um, he's, all, first of all, automatically threatening to play d takes c4 in some lines, and uh, just very active play, active development. And in fact, the Ragozin is a favorite of the strongest chess entity we've ever exp had, which is Alpha Zero. Um, and if you've read the papers on Alpha Zero, as I've read, um, the strongest chess entity created by DeepMind, the subsidiary of Google, um, it actually found that the the Ragozin was the, the line that AlphaZero loved the most to play against D4. So if AlphaZero approves it, it's a pretty good opening. Um, that being said, because I'd noticed Ostrovsky had been playing it so much, I really had an opportunity to prepare quite deeply against this line. And for... Uh, it was a, sort of a rare instance where I actually was able to get a pretty interesting and challenging position right off the bat. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. So I went bishop g5. This is the most common move against bishop b4. The idea is that while he's pinning your king, um, you're pinning this knight to the queen. And the other point is that this bishop that's really the defensive, usually a defensive piece in these openings. Um, in many Queen's Gambit openings, the dark square bishop is a defensive piece. Now with this pin, we're taking advantage of the fact that the bishop isn't on e7 where it quote-unquote normally belongs. So that's essentially the idea there. Now d takes c4 was played. This is a line. Um, another move that's quite possible and common is h6. And this can start off very, very crazy lines. I mean, if bishop h4, there's even g5 as an option, and these type of lines can be quite aggressive. Additionally, white can actually take on f6 like so, and then play a position like this with the queen a4 check, forcing the knight to come to c6, and then taking on d5, and these type of lines have been seen before where white can get an interesting positional game. But um, d takes c4 is actually initiates complications immediately because now he's trying to win this he's won upon this in right from the jump and i have to justify losing this pawn by playing very energetically so i do that by playing the move e4 um, which is the main move here the point is that now i'm actually threatening e5 and causing a crisis in the middle of the board with this knight um, which would be tied to the queen so i'm threatening to win a piece and now black went c5, ignoring the e5 threat, but basically attacking my pawn center. And this has all been played before. I played e5 anyway, again going forward, challenging this knight. And then c takes d4 is played. And I went knight takes d4, still keeping this threat on this knight on f6. And then queen a5. And queen a5 is 
is a very, very good idea. It's been played again before. And the point is, is that you challenge this bishop from the other way. So the idea is that if I take on f6, the bishop gets hit. So I do take on f6, and then bishop takes c3 check is played first. Why is that? If you play queen takes g5 right away, there's actually queen a4 check, actually. And the issue is that knight c6 is the normal move you want to play, but the issue is that after knight takes e6, the bishop on b4 is still a problem, and so you can't just recapture because I'd win a piece. And if you go for um, and if you go for bishop takes c3 here, after b takes c3, now you can't take the knight because the rook on a8 is hanging at the end. So really, you're just down a piece here, and White would have a winning position. So because of that. You actually need to take the bish the knight on c3 first with check, and that's and that's what he did. And then after b takes c3, now queen takes g5 is played. Now I played f takes g7, uh, trying to s spoil Black's pawn structure on the king side, and now queen takes g7 is played, and now I played queen f3. Uh, I would love to take the pawn on c4, but I can't do that right away because if I play bishop takes c4, note that my g2 pawn is hanging, and so queen takes g2 would leave black still up a pawn, and now my king side could, would ar arguably be worse than black's king side as far as the pawn structure is concerned. I definitely wouldn't have a home on the king side anymore. So instead, you play queen f3 first, you protect the pawn on g2, and you prepare to capture the c4 pawn the next move. Black played knight d7, which is normal and has been played before. And now I played bishop takes c4. And black played castles. And now the dust is kind of settled, um, and we're at our first kind of moment, if you will. The material is level, right? I have five pawns, black has five pawns. Uh, black's king has castled already. But both sides have their own weaknesses. So if you look at my weaknesses, you can see that my c3 pawn is pretty weak, right? It's uh, isolated and it's just kind of hanging out there. It is protecting d4, but the d4 knight, but that's pretty much all it's doing. On the flip side, black's king side is slightly weakened because there's no more g7 pawn. But the queen is doing a great job of essentially covering for the white the the black king so it's not a huge problem but the point is we both have three pawn islands we both have our own weaknesses now the immediate threat if you think about it if black if it was black to move here would be to go knight e5 because forking the queen and the bishop here would result in uh, me losing my bishop which is a pretty decent piece here and also note that my queen is overloaded uh, defending g2 so I really don't want to lose that uh, have to move that queen away, recapture there, and lose my pawn on g2. So to deal with that, I went bishop e2, just to deal with the immediate threat of knight e5. Knight c5 was played now, and knight c5 is actually a very good move. The point is, is that this knight is on a very, very good uh, outpost here, potentially, if it's eventually reinforced with b6. And, if, uh, and it also has high ways for to attack the c3 pawn potentially later in the game. And it's just a very good outpost on c5, and it can't easily be challenged. Now, in this position, I think I introduced a move that hadn't been played very much or at all, and I played this knight b3 move. But I want to give you a glimpse of why this knight is good on c5 and show you what happens if I castle. If I castle in this position, it looks like I still have a, a, some type of advantage because this king is a little bit weak here, the queen is covering the g-pawn, and it looks like the bishop on c8 can't move because the pawn on b7 is a little bit loose. I mean, it could go to d7, but it's just not ideally placed there, and my knight is also eyeing the square, so it can't quite go to c6. So it seems like white might have a tiny edge based upon the king's safety here. Well, it turns out after castling that black actually has a better move than bishop d7, and black can actually go b6, amazingly enough. And the idea is that this rook is hanging, yes, but after queen takes a8, there's actually this move bishop b7, and all of a sudden the tables are turned because queen takes g2, mate is a threat, and the queen is attacked. So I'd have to give up my queen 
uh, and I'd have two rooks for the queen here. But the thing is, is black is so active and has really good pieces that it would actually be black here that would have the easier game. And I think black would be better here. So um, really important point that this actually b6 and bishop b7 is a pretty amazing idea and that black doesn't need to move the rook out of the way to get that off. And so I was actually aware of this b6 idea and that's part of the reason I played knight b3 to make, make the knight on c5 less secure and challenge it right away. Knight takes b3 was played, and after a takes b3, now black played bishop d7, and we have another critical position that arises because you have a scenario now in which um, taking on b7 is not a good move at all because after queen takes c3 check, I lose my rook on a1. So I can't take on b7. And the flip side, it looks like after bishop c6, this bishop gets to the diagonal and, you know, white would have, uh, white has some problems to deal with because black has an active bishop, seemingly more active than the one on e2, and black's rooks are already connected, and it just seems like black is in the driver's seat. But I had actually seen this position before at home. I prepared it. And after bishop d7, I actually went for queen g3. And queen g3 is a very, very nice idea. The point is, is that essentially now with the queen on g3, I'm just challenging the queen on g7. And I'm kind of ensuring that I can get to some type of endgame positions where the queens are off the board and I don't have to worry about some of my problems with on the c file. So... Bishop, after rook fc8 was played, rook fc8 was played, I actually uh, am totally fine here because the queen is pinned. So actually after rook fc8, I went c4 amazingly. And the point is that because the queen can't move off this line, it can't take the rook on a1 that looks like it's hanging. And moreover, I ensure that the c file is kind of shut down for the rook right now. It can't really maneuver so much. So this was my little idea was that I was thinking that I'm actually not going to wind up castling because the, now it becomes an end game as soon as the queens are traded. So I don't want to go, I don't want to castle. I want to keep my king in the middle. And my thought process was maybe I can have a slight advantage based upon my pawn structure on the king side being slightly better than black's pawn structure. Because if you look at the position now, I have two pawn islands and black has three. Um, so it's a very, very, very tiny initiative. Again, position is very close to equal, but um, that was the thought. So black went a5, which I actually think is a very, very good move. Um, in many respects, it's trying to undermine my pawn chain, potentially, because my pawns on b3 and c4 are blocking the rooks right now from operating. So maybe if he's able to play a move like a4 at some point and break those up, he, his rooks become active. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting about a5 is that you actually fix my pawns on light squares. So you see that, um, you know, we basically have light squared bishops. So maybe my pawns on light squares can be targets at some point. And so it's, you know, it kind of would be advantageous for him if he's able to put his pawns on dark squares on the queen side because then his pawns aren't targets and mine are. So a5 is a very interesting move. Now, I went king d2, surprisingly. Um, Again, noting that the queens are going to come off the board uh, somehow, some way. And in the meantime, it's important for my king to kind of shuttle towards the queen side to give reinforcements to these pawns. The other thing that's nice about king d2 is my rooks are connected. So it's a very, very unique position, my king just kind of stepping out into the wild like this. But again, the point is the queens are coming off at some point. Note that... Black has been somewhat reluctant to play queen takes g3 because after queen takes g3, I would play h takes g3, and now the h pawn would be a clear target and a, a, a source of counterplay for me. Um, so that's why he's kind of reluctant to, to trade for me. So instead, after king d2, black went bishop c6, challenging my g2 pawn, and now I went for f3. Uh, a move that I really like because the bishop does have a nice square here. Um, it is secure. It's protected by a pawn. But now with my pawn on f3 and g2, my pawns on f3 and g2, I'm blunting the scope of this bishop on the diagonal. And you can see it doesn't actually have squares on the diagonal. So I thought that this was a nice restricting move. 
Black now finally went king f8. And now it was time for me to trade queens because, again, I can't allow this queen to actually roam free with my king this naked. Note that if a move like rook d8 check was played, I would have just gone king c2 and kind of ushered over to the queen side and reinforced these pawns and no harm, no foul. This rook is not doing so much here. So anyways, king f8 was played. Now I have to take the queens. Queen takes g7. King takes g7. And the dust is settled somewhat. And again, we have a position where I have two pawn islands to black's three pawn islands. But black, all in all, is still very solid. I mean, uh, we could definitely, um, I could definitely imagine a scenario where if these pawns all come off the board, it's pretty much a draw because playing the three versus three on the same side is going to be, there's not going to be uh, any type of advantage for me, even if the pawn is uh, not connected to the other ones. So I do have some play as long as some more pawns and pieces stay on the board, and that's what I was thinking. So after king takes g7, I went rook a2. The idea with rook a2 was to you know, make black think about rook h a1 doubling my rooks, but also in some positions to think about going to d2 and trying to control the d-file. So it was multi-purpose. Um, and then there was other lines where maybe my rook actually protects g2. So there was all types of ideas, and I thought the rook on a2 was flexible and didn't really show black exactly what I was trying to do. It just hinted at a few different things. Black went king f6, um, which I kind of expected. Now black has an idea potentially of running the king over to the, the, king, the queen side and securing... Uh, one of these nice dark squares, which are pretty sensitive on my queen side. The other thing with king f6, again, is that now that, that this g file is a little bit open, he might consider playing rook g8 to attack those pawns, particularly the g2 pawn. And I'm kind of reluctant to push my g pawn right away because then the bishop on c6 gets scope. So there's a little bit of a tug of war here in terms of you know what to do and all these types of different little plans. But this is the type of you know, strategic end game that I was happy to play because it's very, very risk-free. Um, white doesn't really have a chance of losing here unless they blunder terribly, and I have a tiny, tiny edge that may work out or might not. Anyways, I went king e3. I thought now that rook j8 was a possibility, I probably would need my king on the queen side to protect the f3 pawn because I didn't want my bishop on e2 to be frozen. So after king e3, black went rook d8, and now I went h4. And this was the start of the other idea I had besides thinking about doubling the rooks, was the point is, is that, again, these pawns are split, so there's a chance that this h7 pawn might be a little bit weak. So in certain positions, it might serve me well to put my pawn on g5 because then this h pawn would be backward and isolated and I might be able to target it in the future. So the point is if I can kind of play on these dark squares on the, on the king side and fix these pawns on light squares, I might have an advantage on the king side to play with while black is trying to liquidate on the queen side. So that was the idea with h4. Now, black could play a move like h5 and stop my g4 push because now after g4, I couldn't do that because after h takes, the bishop is skewering the rook here. But the issue with h5 is that it's very, very committal because when you play h5, you're fixing the pawn on a light square. And so it's a very, very tough move to commit to because you understand that it might be a weakness later. So instead... Black played h6, just putting the pawn on uh, a dark square here and, um, you know, just keeping keeping things kind of under control, keeping the g5 plan under control. But the, it doesn't kind of, it's still, as long as the h pawn exists, it can be a weakness. And that's something to think about later in the game. I went g4 anyway. Again, I want want to go for this kingside expansion. And one thing to think about here is some type of pawn endgames. Because if you can imagine the rooks are all come off the board and the king somehow runs to the queen side, there are actually scenarios where I might be able to get a nice breakthrough in connected with the G G5 sacrifice. So that's something to think about too, because if I can get in a G5, H takes G5, and then H5, my H pawn might just run to the promised land. 
So very, very tricky position to handle, and I think the important thing is as long as his H-pawn is on the board, black has some problems to solve. After she's four, black went king e7, again, shuttling that king towards uh, the queen side. And now I went rook h a1, hitting a5. It's very important that I get counterplay on the queen side before this king runs into c5, because if it gets there, all of a sudden my queen side is extremely weak, and I have to take care of my b3 pawn and just my whole queen side collapsing. So it was very important that I acted to resolve something here before the king got there. Black played b6 to protect that pawn, which was expected. And now I went for c5. Very, very important move. You might say, well, didn't you say that if all these pawns come off the board, it's just a draw? If they're three on three on the same side? Well, I did say that, but the issue is that if, again, if I allow this king to come to d6 and to c5, I have nothing. For instance, if I go bishop f1, this is not the move that's played, obviously, but let's say if bishop f1, just a shuffle, king d6, bishop e2, king c5, all of a sudden I can't, tri I can't do anything here, and my pawns on the queen side are really, really weak. And this king could even um, saddle itself on b4, Let's say I just shuffle, and I have a hard time defending, and now I'm totally on the back foot. Um, these rooks can all of a sudden double here, get very active, and my pawns are just totally weak. And note that once this king is on one of these dark squares, it just can't be harassed. I don't have rook a4 check. I don't have any way to challenge that king. So it's actually critical that I don't allow the king to get there. And that's why c5 is so important because now I'm depriving the king from getting that square because the pawn has that square. So after b takes c5, I went rook takes a5, rook takes, rook takes. And we have another critical position that arises because, okay, now after king d6, we have a scenario where the pawns are all almost liquidated, but I still have a little bit of activity. Note my rook is still very active here. I still have this potential pawn break with g5, and I would argue that my bishop has a little bit more potential than black's as long as it's restricted here. So after king d6, I played rook a7, challenging that pawn on f7. And note, there's a still a little bit of pressure here because, again, if you move this pawn like f6, I can come in behind with a move like rook h7, and now white is actually winning because I can secure this pawn and then push my own. So that would be something that is not advisable. So you can't allow my rook to infiltrate. Note the king can't come back because it's cut off. And so you have to block the seventh rank somehow. And black does this with rook d7. Reasonable enough, blocks that file. Note that I would love to come in from behind with rook a8, but I can't do that because the bishop is controlling that square fine. I also don't want to trade rooks because now this king is very close to the, the, uh, the queen side or excuse me, the king side, and these pawn sacrifices don't work. If I play g5, black can just take, and if I go h5, the king is actually in the square, so I don't manage to queen. So I can't quite trade rooks and win the game, but I can still keep some pressure on, and I do that by playing rook a6. So I kind of play rook a7 just to get the rook to a passive square, and then juke it out and pin the bishop to the king with rook a6. And now black has some issues because now the, if, if, you know, first of all, I'm threatening bishop b5, and second of all, this king can't just move away because the bishop is hanging. So some problems to solve. Black now played rook b7, um, which is a reasonable move, attacking my b3 pawn and preventing the bishop b5 idea. But Again, black is kind of contorting themselves a little bit into some problems because you can see this king is now a little bit is tied, tied to this bishop. This rook is, you know, forced holding the b5 square, and I'm very, very active. And I again, I have the potential to go g5 at some point and try to make something of my queen side or my king side pawns. So in this position, I have to guard against rook takes b3 with check. So I went bishop c4. And now the position is really, really tough because you can see this pin is still on tap. 
this bishop is doing a great job on this diagonal. It's protecting this pawn. And I also have ideas of maybe improving my position by playing f4 and g5 and still squeezing, just almost like a Magnus Carlsen style, just squeezing a little bit. And the other thing you might think about is, well, what if you play you know, a move like f6, trying to, to stem the tide a little bit on the on the, the my pawn advance, well, f6 might run into bishop takes e6. And the point being is after king takes, rook takes c6. Um, this is, this. I win a pawn with check, and I'm not so sure whether this rook endgame is a draw or not, because after king f7, rook takes c5, rook takes b3, check, and king f4, it is true that, um, that it's a three versus two, but because the pawns are split, it's very, very difficult to hold this type of position. For instance, if like rook b4, king g3, king g7, I can make a move like h5, which force, which fixes the king on the second rank, and then I can try to play for rook c7 check and walk my king in. So I think this position is actually very, very close to lost, if not just completely lost. And so very, very difficult to, to do anything here. And and really, Black isn't totally losing, but he kind of has to hold the defensive stance, and it's tough to accomplish. The other thing is that if you go rook c7, you know, just trying to hold the fort here, now I go bishop b5, and I and I transpose actually to a completely winning um, ending, a completely winning king-pawn endgame. Because if you go king d7 trying to break the pin, I think I can go rook takes c6, rook takes c6, still keeping this pin, and now go h5. Point being is that after you release, if you release yourself with king c7, I could trade and go g5, and you can see now that the king is, is way too far to stop that pawn from queening, and it's out of the square. And if you play a move like f6 to temporarily stop my g5 break, I think I might have f4 with the same idea. Uh, point is being that if king d6 takes, takes, g5, and my pawn on, my h pawn goes through. So it's a scenario where black is really, really tied down, and it's tough to make a decision. And after bishop c4, my opponent cracked um, and went for the move e5. E5 unfortunately loses on the spot to a very, very nice move, which I played pretty quickly, but I'll give you a chance to pause the video and try to figure it out on your own. So why don't you pause the video, I'll give you five seconds, and you can try to calculate white to play and win. All right, hopefully you got a chance to pause the video and think on it a little bit. The move I played, which wins, is g5. And this was, again, the move I was kind of teeing up for uh, the whole time. But the beautiful thing is now uh, I'm fixing this f7 pawn on a light square, and I'm having my pawns on dark squares. And essentially, this bishop now is super, super active. So the threats, the combination of having to guard f7, deal with this pin, really just gives black too many problems than he can solve. So the point is that h takes g5 is played, right? You don't want to play h5, and now this pawn is also weakness. But after h takes g5, h takes g5, black is kind of in a zuzwang, believe it or not. So here's the issue. If the king, the king needs is tied to the bishop, right? And the bishop can't move. So let's just examine king moves. The only king moves that where the king can still protect the bishop are king d7 and king c7. But both of those moves drop the f7 pawn because the rook is no longer protecting it. So if king d7, bishop takes f7, and this is a huge pawn because now my bishop can support the pawn on the g pawn right until it queens. So that's a huge, huge pawn. The, now that's one issue. The other issue is that this rook on the b file, you know, it would it needs to protect the f7 pawn. But the issue is that if you go rook c7, for instance, and continue to try to protect it, now I have that move I talked about before, bishop b5. And this pin is a real problem because if king d5, I can actually take here like this and actually transpose to winning king pawn endgame. The issue is that I'm attacking e5, you have to go king d6. And after king f5, 
I think this pawn in game is winning because I just take on f7 and march my pawn up the board. And note that black is way too slow, right? This is just several moves too slow uh, to get his own e pawn rolling. So the issue is that I can actually transpose to king pawn end games because I have more space and my pawn is further advanced on the king side. So essentially, the issue is that no matter, and then again, if black pushes the e pawn, then of course I can just take it. So the issue is that no matter what black does, he's losing material, and it's just a very, very unusual uh, zuzwang. Uh, that's the German word that you know, we use in chess to describe scenarios where any move you make worsens your position. So yeah, so really tough position, and I think uh, Alex realized here what what he'd done, and he went rook b4 kind of flailing, saying, you know what, well, I'm going to give up f7, but I can't allow this bishop b5 pin. But I took that pawn, you know, no hesitation. This bishop is still protecting the pawn on b3, in fact, this king is still pinned to the bishop on c6, and now I'm just threatening g6 and g7. Black went king e7 attacking my bishop, and I could, I, you could consider taking the rook on c6, but actually that's not as clean because after king takes c, f7, we have, oops, not rook b6, let's say rook takes c6, and after king takes f7, this position is probably still winning, but it's just not as cleanly winning because now um, I still might need, I need to show a little bit of technique here. I mean, not a lot, honestly. I have two pawns against nothing, so it's actually totally winning, but I thought I'd had an easier way. And the way that I saw was I could just play bishop c4 back. The point is I'm still attacking the bishop on c6, and now I'm still entertaining g6, g7. And the funny thing is, let's say I move like, I don't know, Let's say a move like uh, bishop d7 is played. After g6, the king can't come closer to attack the pawn because my bishop and rook are controlling the entry squares. And so the only move would be king f8 to try and control the pawn. But now I just have the simple rook a7, and I actually challenge the bishop on d7, and the bishop has to move somewhere, and then I just go g7 and with check, and my pawn queen's on the next move. So the issue is that the king can't really come closer if the bishop retreats. So after bishop c4, black went bishop b5, trying to challenge my bishop and rook. I'd seen this, and I played rook b6. And this seals the deal, because now I'm a pawn up, and the issue is that all these trades work in my favor. Um, and note that after a move like bishop takes c4, I go rook takes b4, a takes b4, and b takes c4. And very importantly, my king is still in the square, so it can uh, secure the b pawn. And this king, unfortunately, can't take care of the g pawn and the c pawn at the same time. They're too far away, and so you can't actually do anything about it. A sample line might be b3, king d2, king d6, and then g6, right? And then the king has to go back to 10 to the g pawn. And if king e7, c5, you know, king f6, c6, and you can see this king cannot secure both pawns at once, whereas, you know, my king secures the b pawn quite easily. So actually in the position after rook b6, Alex actually resigned. I was very, very happy with this game. Um, I thought, frankly, it was kind of a positional masterpiece because, you know, it's very rare that you, you know, you get anything, any reasonable type of position against the Rogozin in such a such a good opening. But I managed to get a very, very slight advantage in an end game that is surprisingly difficult for Black to play. And I also was quite proud of playing this king e king d2 move in the opening, recognizing that my king is very important in the center um, and on the queen side. So I just thought I played a pretty good technical game from start to finish, and it really told me that I was in good form in this tournament. Anyways, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Please like and or subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster journey, please do so by uh, making a donation in the PayPal link in the description below. Thanks. Have a good one.